we begin the class tonight, again, with the understanding that their Bible has a very clear and consistent picture of what the Messiah is, what the Messiah, who the Messiah will be. Jesus didn't do it. And therefore, tonight we're going to try to understand what is the Christian response to the, the class we did last week. The first response that Christianity had, and I believe this was actually a sequential thing. We're going to see there had to be a second response in the class two weeks from tonight. But the first response, which is understandable, is that when Jesus died without fulfilling any of these prophecies, the response of Christianity was to say, well, but he will return at some point in the future to fulfill all these prophecies. This is the Christian doctrine, which is referred to as the second coming, the second coming. Now, it's important to understand that the idea of this second coming is an admission that Jesus did not fulfill any of these prophecies, right? If he had fulfilled these prophecies, you wouldn't need to suggest that he'll have to come back in the future to fulfill them. So the first thing to just, again, recognize is that the doctrine of a second coming is an admission, a realization that Jesus did not fulfill the biblical prophecies. Now, there are going to be five reactions we have, five problems with this idea of the second coming. Okay, five of them. Number one. The first problem is that this is a theory that has no basis in the Bible whatsoever. Meaning that what we would call it would normally be uh, a fudge factor. Meaning that when the experiment doesn't work out, you've got to either admit you were wrong or you come up with some way of fudging or draying, as we say in Yiddish, right? Some way of, of dealing with this problem of Jesus dying without fulfilling the messianic prophecies. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I mentioned this last week. When Jesus died, right, he didn't say as he was dying, touchdown or mission accomplished, right? The Gospels report that his last words were to cry out in great disappointment, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Christians will understand these words differently than I would, but to me, when I read that passage, it seems to me that he recognized that something had gone horribly wrong. Right? He didn't react to his impending death by saying this is exactly what was supposed to happen and mission accomplished. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I believe that it was very clear to him that he did not succeed in his mission. And the people who were following him had two choices, either to admit that, yes, we were wrong, he was not the Messiah, or to come up with at least this, what I would say is a rationalization, meaning that we insist he is the Messiah. He didn't fulfill any of the prophecies. He'll do so when he returns in the future. So this rationalization is basically something that has no basis in the Bible. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks about the Messiah coming and failing and then returning hundreds or thousands of years later to complete or fulfill the mission. Uh, it's basically there's no biblical basis for this idea. Second problem. The second problem is that these passages here we learned them last week, they don't speak about someone returning. Meaning that if the Christian idea was correct, that Jesus will fulfill all these prophecies when he returns, the literary style, at least the way it should read, is someone coming back, returning to do these things. But if you read those passages again, they don't speak about someone coming back, returning to do those things. Those passages have a, let's say, first coming perspective. The person's here doing it, he hasn't been here before. Number three, this is the most important of the problems. Number three is that the idea of a second coming gives absolutely no credibility to Jesus the first time he was here. Meaning, you could put forward the idea of a second coming for any failed Messiah. Anyone that came and failed to do what the Messiah was supposed to do, you could say, yes, but he'll return and do all those things. And the response would be, Mazel Tov, but you're expecting me to believe in him now. You want me to believe in him before he's come back to do anything. So the, the problem with this second coming uh, idea is that it doesn't give us any reason to accept him as the Messiah at this point in history before he's returned. Fourth problem is not so much a problem for us. It's not really, I would include this in the list so much. It's really a problem from a Christian perspective. 
And I'll explain in a minute what this means. If you go through the Christian scriptures, they do speak about Jesus returning to complete the mission. There are many, many passages in the Christian scriptures that speak about the return of Jesus. But they all speak about him returning, not at some indefinite time in the future. They all speak about him coming back imminently in that generation. So, for example, in Matthew chapter 16 and in Mark chapter 9, Jesus says, says, I don't believe Jesus said this, I believe these are words that were put into his mouth afterwards, but he says that there are some of you standing here today who will not taste death. He's speaking to his disciples, and he says there are some of you standing here today who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man returning in his kingdom. Meaning that I'm going to come back and bring about the kingdom change, the definite kingdom change of the world, but some of you will still be alive. Or, in Matthew chapter 24, he says, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Or in 1 John chapter 2, where Jesus speaks about this being the last hour. Or in the book of Revelation, where he says many times, I'm coming back soon. So every single reference to this alleged second coming is not saying that it's going to happen you know, sometime in the distant future. Every single time the idea comes up in the Christian Bible, it's supposed to be happening imminently in that generation. Obviously, that didn't happen. The fifth problem you should be able to figure out from last week's class. To argue that Jesus will return and fulfill all of the messianic prophecies theoretically could be the case, except for one thing, meaning that we noticed last week there was one possible problem with Jesus' credentials that cannot be repaired even if he comes back. And that was the potential problem with his yichus, with his genealogy, with his pedigree. Meaning, if Jesus did not have the proper genealogical pedigree to be the Messiah 2,000 years ago, he can't correct that by coming back. Meaning that he can't be born again, so to speak. He can't change his genealogy. He can't change his pedigree. So that would be a fifth potential problem for this idea of the second coming. Now, we're going to see in two weeks that Christianity had to deal with the failure of Jesus to come back in that generation. We're not going to do that tonight. That was an initial reaction. I mean, the initial reaction upon his crucifixion might have been that he'll return soon. But obviously that didn't happen. And in the Christian Bible, it's interesting that the very first books that are written are not the four Gospels. People often think when they open up a Christian Bible, the first books you happen to read in the Christian Bible are the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which were written really in the order of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mark around the year 70, Matthew around the year 80, Luke around the year 90, John around the year 100. And people assume those were the first books written, and then all the other books came later. But the truth of the matter is that the earliest Christian documents were the letters of Paul written in the 50s. And one of the things that Paul deals with in the 50s, which is basically about you know, 20, 25 years after the crucifixion, people are now saying, uh, no, <laughs> like, it's a generation already. Meaning that now 25 years have passed, 20 years have passed, and he's supposed to be back in the next generation. And so Paul deals with this problem of why hasn't he returned? So we'll discuss in two weeks the way Christianity developed as a reaction to the failure of Jesus to return, even in the second coming. But what we're going to try to do tonight is begin examining the Christian case for Jesus. I think that how do Christians present their case for Jesus? What is the brief for Jesus? How do Christians try to convince us that he actually was the Messiah? So one of the things that is very evident when you read the Christian Bible, all four Gospels focus on this, is the appeal to miracles that Jesus did. It's the appeal to the miracles that Jesus did. Uh, every year, practically, I think for the past nine or ten years, I've given a lecture at one of the Christian seminaries here in Toronto to a group of students that are studying world religions. And they have me come in to do this, the unit on Judaism for the world religions class. And every year they have a long question-answer session 
And usually one of the first questions they ask me is, so why don't you Jews believe that Jesus was the Messiah? So what I do is I go through this presentation, I show them the concept of the Messiah in the Bible and the fact that Jesus didn't fulfill it. And usually they have the same response to me, meaning I've showed them we have this vision of what the Bible speaks about, and it was not accomplished by Jesus. And usually the response is, yes, but what about all the miracles that he did? That's usually one of the first responses. That becomes the argument on behalf of Jesus, right? That he did all these miracles, and therefore, dot, 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 he must be the Messiah. I'll share with you what I, uh, how I respond to these students, and then I'll share with you what I don't say to them. What I usually ask them, I always say, look, Jews always answer a question with a question, right? So uh, the question I always ask is, how many times does the Bible teach us that we will know who the Messiah is based upon miracles that he will do? I think that, again, we discussed last week the importance of definitions, and you really can't know anything in the world unless you have definitions. So does the Bible ever lay out definitionally, that, yes, we will be able to know who the Messiah is because he's going to be someone that comes and does pretty cool miracles. So I asked the students, how many times did the Bible say that? How many times did the Bible say we will know who the Messiah is based upon the miracles he will do? And the answer, and they know the answer, is never. The Bible never says that's going to be a way of knowing who the Messiah is. But then I asked them a follow-up question because it's important to understand why does the Bible not say miracles will help verify who the Messiah is? So I asked them, why doesn't the Bible say that miracles will verify that someone is the Messiah? And here they don't usually have an answer so quickly. But I showed them that in the Bible we see that there are many people that are not such good people that are able to do miracles. For example, in the seventh and eighth chapters in the book of Exodus, you have it on your first sheet here, we see that Moses did miracles in Egypt, right? Moses did many miracles in Egypt, and Pharaoh's magicians were able to replicate some of those miracles. So the fact that his magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, could replicate the miracles doesn't mean that they're sent by God necessarily uh, in a positive way, right? That it doesn't mean they're good people because they can do miracles. There's actually a more important passage in the Jewish Bible. In the 13th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, God even warns us. God says that there are going to be people who will be false prophets, and God says they will be able to perform incredible supernatural miracles. So God is not just you know, bringing it up as a possibility. God actually says it's going to happen. There are going to be people who will have the ability to do incredible supernatural miracles, and they're false prophets. You're not supposed to listen to them. So the obvious question would be, well, if they're false prophets, why would God give them the ability to perform supernatural miracles? Why would God allow them to do such miracles? So the Bible itself says, right? Why would God give them that ability? So the Bible says because God's going to be testing us to see whether we're going to follow him or these prophets that can do fancy magic tricks. But we see in the Jewish Bible that the ability to do miracles is not necessarily prove you're a good guy. And I show the Christian seminary students that their Bible says the same thing. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, you have it on your sheets here, it says that false messiahs will have the ability to do incredible supernatural miracles and mislead many people, even the elect. Now, it doesn't require a PhD in philosophy to figure out that if a false messiah can do a miracle, a miracle can never prove someone is the real messiah. Right? Once you know that a false messiah can do miracles, miracles do not have the ability to prove that you are the real messiah. That's the way I usually approach this question for these seminary students. I, I accept the possibility that Jesus did miracles. I don't dispute that. But I say even if he did miracles, it doesn't prove anything. Right? It doesn't prove anything. Now, what I'll share with you is what I don't deal with, with these people. because I don't want to irritate them unnecessarily. What I would say probably as a preface to that, would be, I don't necessarily have any good reasons to believe that Jesus did the miracles the Christian Bible claims that he performed. 
Right? They wouldn't bother me if he did them, but I don't have any real solid reasons to necessarily believe that he did these miracles. Obviously, we don't, as a Jewish people, and Christians for that matter as well, we don't believe everything that's written down in any book in the world, right? I mean, the fact that the New Testament claims Jesus did miracles doesn't mean that we, as Jews, automatically accept them as being true. For example, we wouldn't believe everything in the Quran is true, everything in the uh, Book of Mormon is true, everything in the Bhagavad Gita is true, everything in Reverend Moon's Divine Principle is true. There are many, many religious books that have been written over history. We don't say that it must be true because it's written in some book somewhere. So the Christian can't simply assume that because the Christian Bible says it, Jewish people are going to jump and say, oh, of course, it must have happened then. Now, what I want to do is spend a few minutes analyzing the credibility of the Christian Bible. Meaning that why is it that we may not necessarily accept the stories in there uncritically? Why is that the case? So one thing to remember is that these stories about Jesus I mentioned a few moments ago were not written contemporaneously with the events. Jesus dies around the year 30. The earliest stories, Paul again doesn't really tell us any stories about Jesus. Paul in the 50s is only writing about his beliefs about Jesus, but the historical narratives about Jesus are first written 40 years later in the Gospel of Mark. Now 40 years today is a long time. 40 years back then was an eternity. So 40 years later, in Matthew 50 years later, in Luke 60 years later, in John 70 years later, that's when the stories are being written. Secondly, we have to remember that these stories are not being written by journalists or historians. That's an important thing to remember. They weren't written by a historian or a journalist who is, by definition, supposedly objective. They're written by evangelists. And John, in his Gospel, Chapter 20, verse 31, you don't have this on your sheet. But in John's Gospel, he says, why are these stories being written? He basically tells you that he has an agenda. So John says that the story with the problem with these Bibles with the paper is so thin, you need an electric microscope to grab them. He says in chapter 20, verse 31, but these stories are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, right? I'm writing this story to convince you to believe in Jesus. Now, he's confessing on some level that he's not writing necessarily as a journalist or as a historian. He's writing as a salesman or a, writing religious propaganda. So it's important to understand who these people are. Now, again, it doesn't mean necessarily that what he's saying isn't true. But as an outsider, I have my suspicions already, meaning that I'm reading stories written decades later by people who are admitting that they're not journalists or historians. They're writing basically religious propaganda. They're trying to convince people to believe in Jesus. So again, it doesn't impeach the story, but it doesn't make me assume automatically that it must be true. And now we have a third question. Is there any possibility that a person writing stories to convince others to believe in Jesus, is there a possibility they might invent miracle stories or exaggerate stories in order to convince people to believe in Jesus? Is that a possibility? So the truth of the matter is we weren't around 2,000 years ago. We don't know these people. But what we can do is look at contemporary Christian uh, sources. And we'll see that today, it's a certainty that Christians will invent miracle stories in order to try to convince people to believe in Jesus. And it's not me saying it. These are Christian researchers themselves that are willing to admit that these stories that are told nowadays are not always true. So let's begin uh, on page... Well, it's the next page. It's the second page you have here. So you have a copy of, I know that it doesn't read clearly on top, but this is a magazine called the Mishpacha Message. Mishpacha, the Hebrew word for family. And if you can read the tiny print on top, it's published by Jews for Jesus. This is a Christian 
missionary organization. This is the spring 1991 newsletter. What you should know is that the Mishpacha message was not written as an evangelistic tool to try to convert non-believers. This was an in-house publication for the supporters, people that are part of Jews for Jesus, the people that send them money and their supporters. So this is basically an in-house publication for Christians. And let me read with you this page. In preparing for this issue of the Mishpacha message, we invited you all to send in accounts of any miraculous healings that have taken place in your lives. Now again, you have to appreciate they're not sending this out to 25, 30 people, right? There are thousands of people that are belonging to Jews for Jesus. So they asked people, send in any accounts of miraculous healings that took place in your life. We also asked that independent verification be provided for these healings. We received a number of inspiring testimonies, yet there was no one who had an instance where a medical test had been made to diagnose a condition with the corresponding test made later to show that a healing took place that was contrary to the laws of nature. It doesn't say, by the way, a few, right? There was none. One person on our regular mailing list who does not receive the Mishpacha message claimed to have a healing where a diagnosis was made and recorded of bone cancer and that tests were done after the alleged healing showing that the cancer had disappeared. In fact, the person explained that the doctor himself was the one healed of the cancer. When we called to verify this with the doctor whose name had been supplied, he was quite adamant in telling us that he had no idea what we were talking about and that he didn't hold to that sort of thing. Now listen to what they say. Sadly, this type of experience is all too common. Again, it's not a Jewish cynic, right, who's saying that these stories are made up and fabricated. Here it's the missionaries, Jews for Jesus, admitting that this kind of situation where people claim miracles have happened and they weren't really happening, at least in terms of any kind of objective criteria, it takes place, it's all too common. Let's go on. When a good friend of mine, a Jewish believer in Jesus who is a medical doctor, heard that we were considering miracles for this forum article, he wrote a word of caution. Apparently, my friend had done some personal investigation to verify the miracles in a number of books written concerning signs and wonders. He read the books thinking that God might be calling him into a healing ministry. But to his dismay, he found each of the instances, not some, he found that each of the instances where healing was claimed to be questionable. Now again, you have to appreciate, this is not a non-Christian calling these stories into question. This is a Christian, a believing Christian, who's saying, you know what? A lot of these stories are just not true. My friend knows and loves the Lord and believes that God works in the lives of people today. He believes in the miracles of the Bible and believes that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His caution was based on his own experience and training as a medical doctor as well as the conclusions he drew from researching various believers' claims to the miraculous. So if we know today, there are other examples, by the way. You know, there have been many people who researched these alleged miracles. In, in Toronto, by the way, a number of years ago, there was this whole news story that at the airport vineyard church the people's teeth were being spontaneously filled with golden fillings and golden teeth and they were reporting this all over the news that these great miracles were happening at the airport vineyard church people had gold sprinkling down on them or gold fillings in their teeth and over the coming months even the people at this church had to admit that these stories really were questionable or fabricated or not true so if we know that today Christians that are bent on trying to convince people to believe in Jesus, they would make up, fabricate, or exaggerate stories in order to convince people to believe in Jesus, it's certainly within the realm of possibility that gospel writers 2,000 years ago would have done the same thing. Another thing to question is, is there any outside corroboration for the New Testament stories? Meaning that if we look at the Christian accounts of Jesus, it would be more reassuring if there was some corroboration or verification outside the Christian Bible. So the thing to bear in mind is not only are these people not objective, not only are they quite capable of exaggerating or inventing stories, 
we have to realize that these stories are the only source of information that we have. There are no other documents, no other sources that would verify or corroborate what they say. As a matter of fact, we have a number of places where outside verification refutes what the Christian Bible says. Let me share with you a few examples. The procurator of Judea at the time of Jesus, meaning the man responsible for crucifying Jesus, was Pontius Pilate. Now Pontius Pilate is someone that we have quite a bit of information about in historical sources. Jesus, you should know, there's almost nothing about him outside the Gospels. Almost nothing about Jesus outside the Gospels. Pontius Pilate is well documented. Now when you read the Christian Bible, it's quite amazing. I mean, the whole story becomes quite incredible. What they describe is Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the week of Passover, and it describes huge crowds of Jewish people greeting him as the Messiah. Huge throngs of Jews coming out with palm branches saying, Hosanna, the son of David. It's quite an incredible story that here he is coming into Jerusalem a week before Passover when the Jewish people were expecting the Messiah to show up. Passover time. The Talmud says, just like we were redeemed at Passover, we will be redeemed at Passover. And then what happens is, a few days later, he's captured by the Romans, thrown into prison, and then there's a trial. At the trial, we're told that the Romans were very nice, sweet people, and they would allow one Jew to go free every year on the Jewish holidays. There was a get-out-of-jail-for-free card. There's no corroboration anywhere that the Romans had such a practice. It's even almost impossible to believe that they would have done such a thing because they were so paranoid about revolutions that they would let a revolutionary out of jail is hard to imagine. In any event, they say that Pontius Pilate offered the Jewish people to let anyone out of jail. Now, it says in the Gospels there were two people held in prison. There was Jesus, who was just recently greeted as the Messiah of the Jewish people, and there was someone named Barabbas, who was a criminal, a murderer or a brigand, the highwayman, and he gives them a choice, who should I free from prison? And the Jews scream, give us Barabbas. Now, it's almost impossible to understand this story as being historically possible, that here the Jewish people had just welcomed, it says, Jesus as the Messiah, He's thrown into jail, and now they have a chance of getting him out of jail. But they say, no, we don't want Jesus. We'll take the murderer, Barabbas. And then Pontius Pilate says to the Jews, and what should I do with Jesus? And they scream, crucify him, crucify him. And then they say, and let, our, and let his blood be on our heads and our children's heads. Meaning that we'll, t we'll take responsibility for the blood of this Jesus, this innocent person, and not just us, we're going to also curse our children. Very difficult to imagine Jewish parents cursing their children like that. In any event, the Christian Bible says that Pontius Pilate didn't want to kill Jesus. He thought he was innocent. So why did he end up crucifying Jesus? Because the Christian Bible says he was intimidated by the Jewish crowds. He was intimidated by the Jewish crowds. They bullied him. So when you read the Christian Bible, what you find is an almost entirely unbelievable story where at the end it claims that this Pontius Pilate was a very meek uh, guy, very, very easily intimidated and bullied by the Jews, and they basically forced him into crucifying Jesus. And the problem with this account is that all of the sources outside of the Gospels, which includes Philo of Judea, and Josephus, and even the Roman sources, tell us that this Pontius Pilate was not just a brutal, merciless procurator. He was just about the worst that was ever in Israel. He was so brutal that the Roman high command back in Rome basically removed him from his position in Israel because of all the atrocities he committed against the Jews. So the, the Christian Bible portrays him as a weak Casper, milk toast, easily intimidated and bullied by the Jews. But every other source extant paints him as a brutal person who committed horrible atrocities at the drop of a hat against the Jews. So we have, and there are many places where the historical sources that we know are objective, they're historical, don't jive with the Christian story. And it gives us reason to suspect maybe these stories are not 
1,000% factual. Or, we'll be reading this next week, it's one of the reasons, again, why it's hard to believe that Pontius Pilate was so conciliatory towards Jesus, because the Christian Bible says, when Jesus was just a little baby, right, just born, Herod, who was ruling at that time, Herod heard that the Jewish Messiah was born, and this is not a 30-year-old man that has a small army of people that marched into Jerusalem with him. This is a little infant. What does Herod do when he hears the Jewish Messiah is born? The Christian Bible claims that he sent a small army, a small bunch of soldiers to Bethlehem, and in order to make sure that they get rid of this little kid Jesus, the Christian Bible claims, at least in the book of Matthew, that Herod's soldiers killed every Jewish baby boy in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding cities under the age of two to make sure that this little kid is no longer going to be alive. That's how threatened the Romans would have been of anyone claiming to be the Messiah. So Herod goes to the extent of butchering two-year-old babies, and Pontius Pilate sees no problem with someone claiming to be the Messiah. It's totally not understandable, because normally you have to appreciate the Romans crucified over 100,000 Jews. They didn't crucify people for double-parking their camels. Crucifixion was a horrible execution given primarily to troublemakers, to people that the Romans saw as threats. And one kind of person the Romans would certainly see as a threat was anyone claiming to be the Messiah. Because that meant, I'm the king, and you people are out. So the Christian Bible itself says there were several other people claiming to be the Messiah back then, and they were killed by the Romans. So to understand this story that Herod, I'm sorry, that, that Pontius Pilate saw nothing wrong with Jesus claiming to be the Messiah, he didn't see anything wrong with him, he was going to let him go free, totally impossible to understand. But here in the beginning of the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 2, we're told that Herod sent a small delegation to kill every Jewish baby under the age of two in Bethlehem and all the surrounding cities. Now, I would think that if such an event actually took place, there'd be some record of it. We would know about it. That would be a big story, a big news story. Every Jewish baby under the age of two in Bethlehem and all the surrounding cities are murdered by the Romans. So why is it not recorded in any Jewish source? It's not in the Talmud, it's not in Philo, it's not in Josephus. Josephus spends 40 chapters, 40 chapters describing the life of Herod, the life of this man Herod. He doesn't see fit to mention that Herod had all these babies massacred. It doesn't make it its way into any Roman sources, into Tacitus or any Roman historical source. It doesn't make its way into any other books in the Christian Bible. Mark doesn't speak about it. Luke doesn't speak about it. John doesn't speak about it. So when I read Matthew, I mean, do I have any right to wonder whether this stuff happened? I would imagine that if it really did happen, there'd be some echo, there'd be some source. Matthew says later on in his book, in the 27th chapter, that when Jesus was crucified, he says, the graves of many righteous people in Jerusalem opened up. These people came out of their graves, walked around Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. Now, if I was Matthew, what I would have done is I would have said, when Jesus was crucified, the graves of many righteous people opened up, and they came out of their graves, and I would have shut my mouth. But he goes on to say, not only did they come out of their graves, he said, and they appeared to many people in Jerusalem. So if that really happened, if that story happened as Matthew writes it, I would have imagined that would have been a pretty big news story. Jewish people living in Jerusalem are seeing all these people who had been dead coming out of their graves that are now appearing to them. So it should have made it into the newspapers. Josephus should have spoken about it. Philo, the Talmud, the Roman sources, the other Gospels. Let Luke and Mark and John speak about it. No, Matthew insists that it happened. So I think as an objective reader, we would say, that's a pretty amazing story. If it really did happen, we would have expected some trace of it, some echo somewhere. I just want to mention two more ideas about miracles that I, I really should have mentioned before, but I will share them with you now. It's important to appreciate that the Christian Bible isn't the only place where it's claimed that miracles take place. If you do any kind of study of world religions, both ancient religions and present religions, 
you'll see that all of these religions claim that miracles take place. Um, if you speak to Mormons today, every Mormon has their testimony, which includes miracles that took place in their life. There was a video that went around a few years ago on the internet of the Hindu elephant god Ganesh. I think it's pronounced Ganesh or Ganesh. And it was quite amazing, this elephant god, this statue, all over the world there was slurping up milk that was put in front of it. It was quite amazing. And if you go to the Sai Baba cult in India, Sai Baba, they claim many miracles happened through him. And basically, every religion in the world is able to claim miracles happen. So, Jews, we have plenty of miracles. Go through the Talmud, there are many miracle workers among the Jews. So, if every religion in the world has miracles, it's very clear that miracles can never prove which religion is true. Right? If every religion has miracles, miracles simply cannot prove which religion is true. Miracles can only prove one thing. Miracles can prove one thing only. Miracles can prove there's a God that runs the world. There's a God in the world. They don't tell you which religion is true, if all religions have miracles. I'll share with you two personal stories, and then we'll go on. Uh, I was working in Philadelphia many years ago, and uh, I met a university student, a young Jewish university student, who converted to Christianity. We began discussing his story, and I asked him, how did he get involved with Christianity? And he told me that he had all these uh, experiences in the church he went to. He would have these miracles happen to him. A, Jew? a Jewish, young Jewish university student who converted to Christianity. And he was telling me that he converted because he had these miraculous experiences in the church. And I asked him to share with me some of the experiences. He told me that his back hurted and he went into the services. And at the end of the services, his back felt better. He told give me a number of stories like this. And I asked him, do you believe that miracles prove that a religion is true? I asked him that. Do you believe that miracles prove a religion is true? And he said, of course, that's why I became a Christian, because I saw all these miracles in church. So I asked him, if you believe miracles prove that a religion is true, I asked him, how do you account then for the miracles that I've seen? I asked him, how do you explain the miracles that I've seen? Now, he told me again, you have to appreciate fairly low-level miracles. His back felt better. He told me once he was driving in a car, he hadn't, thought of, he hadn't heard a song in a long time, and turned on the radio, and that song came on. And then one night he told me that he was in his friend's house, there was no, no food to eat, and they opened up one cabinet, and there was his favorite food. I mean, they were just cute stories, but he said to me, you had miracles? I said, yes, I've had miracles. So he asked me to share my miracles. I told him two, and I've had many more than that. One miracle I shared with him was that in 1977, I was driving to a wedding in Detroit, and in, in Pennsylvania, my car went over a cliff. The car went over a cliff, flipped over about 10 times, the car was squashed completely flat, and I walked out without a scratch, basically. So I told him, I think that was a pretty cool miracle. I told him when I was studying in yeshiva in Israel in 1980, my roommate's cousin was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. The whole school prayed for his cousin, and he recovered completely. I told him that I've seen many miracles like this. So I said to him, if a, if a miracle proves a religion is true, how do you account for the miracles that I've seen? Because you've told me that you became a Christian because of the miracles you've seen. And you believe that a miracle proves a religion is true. So he said to me, you don't understand. He said, all those miracles that you saw, they were done by the devil to confuse you. Everything that you experienced was done by Satan to confuse you. Why? He said, because Satan basically wants you to go to hell. How is Satan going to get you to go to hell? By keeping you away from Jesus. Because again, the only person that can go to heaven is someone who believes in Jesus. So the devil wants to get you to go to hell by keeping you away from Jesus. And the best way for the devil to keep you away from Jesus is to do all these miracles that will make you a stronger Jew. And the stronger a Jew you are, the less likely it is you're going to come to Jesus and you're going to go to hell. So I said to him, okay, so you believe then, you believe that the devil runs around the world doing miracles to confuse people. He said, absolutely. So I said, fine. So how do you know that the miracles that you saw were not done by the devil to confuse you? <laughs> His brain tilted for a second. You could see he was confused because, again, what's real? 
right? He was convinced that the devil runs around the world doing miracles to confuse people. Mazel tov. Second story, uh, and this actually happens quite, a, quite frequently. I was at a very, very large missionary conference. I spend time discussing uh, things with a missionary, a Jewish person that converted to Christianity. And I asked him to share his story. He told me he grew up in a very traditional Jewish home. He didn't have much of an education, but very traditional. And he had Christian friends that were basically pestering him to accept Jesus. And they were praying for him, and they were giving him literature to read, and inviting him to their Bible studies. And he began, he told me, getting drawn to Jesus. But he said, but I'm a Jew. And he was very confused. Should I believe in Jesus? Should I not believe in Jesus? He told me he was tortured. He was going back and forth. He didn't know what to do. So he said to me, one day I decided it's enough torture. I'm tired of being torn back and forth. He said, he cried out to God. He said, God, show me what to do. Should I believe in Jesus? Should I not believe in Jesus? He says to me, at that moment, a lightning bolt entered his room. The lightning bolt chased him around the room. It went into his stomach and came out of his head. Now he's telling me this story, and inside, I didn't say this to him, inside I'm saying to myself, I think this guy did too much drugs in the 60s. <laughs> but I would never say that, because he, that's his experience. He feels that that's what happened. But I asked him a very, I think, significant question. I said, you know, if that had happened to me, if what you're describing happened to me, I would have taken that as a no answer. Meaning here you're torn, you don't know what to do. You cry out to God, should I believe in Jesus or not? And a lightning bolt strikes you in the stomach and comes out your head. Why do you assume that's God telling you yes? I mean that what happens is people may have experiences sometimes, but they interpret those experiences. I once had a young university student tell me that he was in England, he's going to school in England. He was walking in an alleyway and he told me he dropped dead in the alleyway. He died. And he told me as he was lying there dead, he heard a voice. And the voice said, now that you died for me, now you must live for me. And he became a Christian. So I asked him, how do you know the voice was Jesus? Maybe it was Mohammed. Maybe it was Moses. Maybe it was the Baal Shem Tov. Maybe it was... Why do you assume it was Jesus? So what happens is people may have unusual experiences, but they give it their own personal spin. They give it their own personal twist. Okay. One more piece on the uh, topic of miracles, which is that among Christians, one miracle trumps all other miracles, meaning that in Christian circles, the fact that Jesus might have walked on water or healed people or even brought people back from the dead or might have turned water into wine or made the loaves multiply, all the miracles in the Christian Bible are fairly insignificant in comparison to what they feel is the central miracle, which is his resurrection, the fact that they claim Jesus came back from the dead. That, in Christian terms, is the ultimate miracle, because they say in the Christian Bible, if it didn't happen, then your faith is in vain. So, let's again just review a little bit about this topic of miracles. Number one, there is absolutely no reason for us to believe that such a thing happened. Again, the only evidence there is, if I use the word advisedly, the only evidence there is of the resurrection would be the accounts in the Christian Bible. And again, there's no reason for anyone to simply accept those accounts uncritically as if they were a newspaper account. So number one, there's no real reason to believe that such a thing happened. Number two, again, even if it happened, it would not prove anything. Again, our Bible never tells us we'll know who the Messiah is because he's going to be resurrected from the dead. So that's important to, to know as a foundation. There's no reason to believe the story of the resurrection. Number two, even if it happened, it would prove nothing. But we have some more problems with the resurrection story. Problem number one is that, interestingly, if you map out the resurrection story in the Christian Bible, and you go through the storyline point by point by point, you'll see that it virtually doesn't have any consistency in the four Gospels, meaning that the four Gospels tell four very different stories about what allegedly happened 2,000 years ago. So when you read four very different accounts, it makes you wonder, well, what really happened back then? And is there any kind of clarity in terms of what happened? And why would anyone believe a story that they can't get true, they can't get this straight, meaning this is the central story of Christianity, and they can't get this story straight. So for example, 
What day was Jesus crucified? What day did it happen? So the Synoptic Gospels, those are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that Jesus was crucified on the first day of Passover. But in the Gospel of John, it says he was crucified the day before Passover. So which one was it? Was it the day before Passover, or was it Passover? What time was he crucified? So in Mark, he was crucified at 9 o'clock in the morning, and in John, he was crucified at noon. So what was it? Was it 9 or was it noon? How long was he in the tomb? How long was he in this tomb? So in the Synoptic Gospels, he's in the tomb for three days and two nights. He's there for three days and two nights. In John, he's there for two days and two nights. How many people first came to the tomb after he was, after he was buried in the tomb? So Matthew says two people came. Mark says three people came. Luke says there were more than four that came. And John says there were one person that came. So there were four totally different accounts. Who is first seen when these people show up at the tomb? What do they first see? So Matthew says that an angel was seen. Mark says a man was seen. Luke says that two men were seen. John says no one was seen. Again, if you plot out the story point by point by point, you get four totally different stories. What instructions does Jesus allegedly give to the people that he finally sees? So in Mark and in Matthew, he says to them, go to the Galilee and I'll meet you there up in the Galilee. In Luke, he says to them, don't go to the Galilee, stay here in Jerusalem. So what happened? By the way, in John, there's no instructions whatsoever. To whom does Jesus first appear? Who does he make his first appearance to? Matthew says to two Marys, two women named Mary. To Mark, it's just to Mary Magdalene. To Luke, it's Cleopas and another woman. To John, it's just Mary, Mag Mary Magdalene. But again, this is a very, very brief synopsis. If you go through the story in greater detail, you'll find that there's literally no corroboration between any of the stories. Most Christian apologists say, well, it's not a big deal. Because they say, if you take any event, four people will never see it in the same way. They'll say, for example, if you see an automobile accident and you have four eyewitnesses, they'll all differ. Was, it, was the car dark gray? Was it, dark, was it light? Was it black, dark blue? They will not always agree 100%. The problem is that none of the gospel writers were eyewitnesses. Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, none of them were there on the scene. Secondly, these kind of differences, like what color was the tree, would not account for differences in terms of serious facts, like what day did it happen. So witnesses might disagree on a fine-tuning issue, like how dark was the car, but did it take place on Passover or the day before Passover? That would not make a difference whether there were different witnesses to the events. In your source sheets, you'll see that I have a list of 11 questions that deal with the resurrection. Don't look at it now, please. When you go home, feel free to study 11 questions I wrote about the resurrection. Questions like, was Jesus resurrected as a body or did he come back only as a spirit? You'll see there's a huge de debate in the Christian Bible about that. Also in the Christian Bible, you'll see that the stories of Jesus coming back are not so clear. It says that often his own disciples didn't even recognize him. So when we are told stories where he allegedly comes back, but even his closest followers didn't even recognize him, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in the resurrection account altogether. I want to share with you what I think is a question that most Jewish people are bothered by. If you remember the first class that we had, there was a psychological problem that Christians felt. Go back to the first class. There was a huge psychological cr problem that Christians were bothered by. And that psychological problem was, if Jesus really was the Messiah, they were bothered by, why don't the Jews believe in it? It bothered them, right? You know, you know I'll give you just a simple example. I remember there was a time when milk bottles, milk uh, containers, sometimes had the pictures of missing children on them. Right? You sometimes saw a child missing. So imagine there's a story that, say, God forbid, some kid goes missing here in Toronto. And uh, you know, they put his face up on the side of the milk container. 
and the milk cartons go all over the country. And after a year and a half, the family in Toronto receives a phone call from a family in Winnipeg. And they say, you know, we saw your kid's uh, likeness on the side of a milk container, and we think we know where he is. We think that he's being, uh, there's a family down the street here that has your child. So obviously the family from Toronto immediately flies out to Winnipeg, and they arrange to try and see this little child. And the parents meet this little child, and they say, oh, it's not our kid. And the people in Winnipeg so, say, no, we're pretty sure it's your kid. <laughs> look, can't you see how they, similar they look? And the parents say, trust us, right? it's not <laughs> our kid, right? So this person in Winnipeg who was hoping to get a big reward, right, you know, is going to be bothered now because they were assuming that this is the child that's missing. But you have the parents themselves saying, no, it's not our child, right? When the parents tell you it's not the child, that's a pretty big problem, right? It's a pretty big problem if you are, want to collect on the reward. So 2,000 years ago, uh, you know, there are people who believe Jesus is the Messiah, but the people that were believing in him were basically... Uh, primarily at least, non-Jews. Because again, the Jewish people understood he wasn't the Messiah. Paul recognized that. Paul says in his book of Acts, when he writes in the book of Acts, that since the Jewish people do not believe in Jesus, Paul says, I'm going to go to the Gentiles. And Paul does a very, very good job of converting many Gentiles to his understanding of who Jesus was. And this movement basically grows only among Gentiles. And at one point, they begin to wonder, wait a minute, we are Johnny-come-latelys. What do we know about the topic of the Messiah? We used to worship uh, bugs. We used to worship animals. We never even had a Bible. The people back in Israel who believed in God and who had a Bible and who they knew what the Messiah was supposed to be, they don't believe in Jesus, that bothered the church. The church was very bothered by this. So we saw the first week of class that the psychological problem that the church felt was how is it possible that the Jews don't believe in Jesus? I believe that we have the exact opposite psychological problem. You know, when I was in university, I remember a test, uh, an experiment done by a Jewish professor in the 50s named Solomon Ash. Very famous experiment where Ash had a group of university students, maybe 30 students, and he had different sized lines. And he wanted the people that came into the experiment to report whether another line was similar to one of these lines. I'm not going to give you the exact experiment, but basically it was an experiment measuring people's perception of the size of lines. The way the experiment was carried out was that the answer should have been very obvious. But everyone in the room was told to give the wrong answer. So everyone that went into the room for this experiment was told, say that it, it's A. Say A is the correct answer. When obviously B was the correct answer. And what they wanted to do in the experiment was to see what would happen when the naive, right, the naive, innocent subject, who was not told in advance anything, would be asked the same question. After hearing all of the people in the room give the wrong answer, right? So everyone has just said the correct answer is A, and Ash wanted to see what is this innocent, naive student going to say. He found that 70% of the students went along with the rest of the group. 70% went along with the rest of the group. Because there's two possibilities. If you are that innocent, naive student, and you hear all these people saying the correct answer is A, but you see with your own eyes it's not A, there's two possibilities. Either you say to yourself, well, I don't care what everyone else says. I, I, I know what I see, and it's very clear to me that A is not the correct answer. So I'm not going to just be a sheep and go along with everyone else. I know what I see, I'm going to stick to my guns, and I'm not going to agree with the rest of the group. You could say that. But 70% of the students didn't say that. 70% of the students said to themselves, wait a minute, you mean I'm the only one that's getting it right? Everybody else in the room is wrong? Is that possible? That I'm the only one that's right, everyone else is getting it wrong? And 70% of the people had a difficult time accepting that possibility, that they were the only ones that were right. So... So, the Ash experiment teaches us that when you're a minority, if you're a small group, a small number of people, a minority, 
it's very difficult to stick up for your beliefs in spite of what the majority says. If the whole room says, all the other 30 students are saying that A is the correct answer, you're going to have a very difficult time ignoring them. Even though with your own eyes you see they're wrong, you're going to say to yourself, maybe I'm wrong. You're going to question yourself. Here we live in a world where there are 2.2 billion Christians that believe in Jesus. 2.2 billion Christians believe in Jesus. 1.5 billion Muslims that also believe in Jesus. Right? So the whole world basically believes in Jesus. And the Jews, 13 million of us, have to basically say, I don't care if the whole world believes in it, we know they're wrong. And I believe psychologically it's very difficult for Jewish people to maintain that kind of strength. I believe that psychologically what bothers us is the opposite of what bothers the Christians. The Christians are bothered by how is it possible that the Jews didn't believe in Jesus and Jews, I believe, are bothered how is it possible that so many people believe in him, especially when it's so clear to us they're wrong. I mean that to us, we who understand what the Messiah is supposed to be, we who understand exactly what the Messiah is supposed to do, we who have a very clear definition and template and criteria for the Messiah, who see that it wasn't Jesus, we wonder how in the world is it possible for so many people to believe he's the Messiah. And I think that psychologically it bothers us. We have a difficult time with it. And I think that it makes many of us question ourselves. You mean we're right and the rest of the world is wrong? Is that possible? Yes. That we're right and everyone else is wrong? Of course it's possible. I, I think I mentioned the first week of class that I once had a minister who said to me, you Jews have a lot of chutzpahs. Right? You Jews have a lot of chutzpah. I said, why do you think we have so much chutzpah? He said, because you Jews believe you're right and the rest of the world is wrong. So I said, let's do an experiment. Let's go back in history 2,000 years to the day before Jesus. I asked this Christian minister, to the day before Jesus, you had Jews who believed in one God that created the whole world, and everybody else were pagans. The rest of the world 2,000 years ago were pagans who worshipped sticks and bugs and trees and animals and the stars and the sun and the moon. I asked the Christian minister, who was right, the Jews or the rest of the world? He said, obviously the Jews are right and the rest of the world was wrong. So I said, so why do you think it's so strange to say that the Jews are right and the rest of the world is wrong? That's exactly what you're saying to me now. That's the way it was 2,000 years ago. Why would you think anything's changed? So what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just uh, think through with you this question. How is it possible for Christians to have gotten this wrong? So what I'm going to do is share with you several historical stories. And I think these historical stories will bring some clarity to the question about Christianity. Let's go back to the year 16. 48. In 1648, the Jews had just gone through a horrible massacre by a Cossack named Bogdan Chelmonitsky. He butchered over 100,000 Jews. And you had two things taking place in the world back then. Here you had an immense massacre of Jews, terrible, horrible persecution of Jews. Plus, you had many mystics back then, many mystics that predicted that in the year 1648 the Messiah would come. Well, guess what happens in the year 1648? Shabtai Tzvi, a very great Jewish scholar, claims that he is the Jewish Messiah. Because there are two things that made it very easy for him to swing his case. Number one, there were many mystics that predicted that in 1648 the Messiah would show up. And number two, the Jews were reeling, the Jews were terribly shocked by this horrible pogrom that wiped out so many Jews. They were, they were so desperate for someone to come and, and basically make things better for them. So Shabtai Tzvi claims to be the Messiah. He wasn't living in Israel. He was living in Turkey. And you had, you should understand, many, many, many Jewish people who accepted his claim. He attracted thousands of followers. Thousands of followers. Now, what did it mean to say in the year 1648 that you thought Shabtai Tzvi was the Messiah? It didn't mean that you ran around Constantinople just saying, I believe in Shabtai Tzvi. That's not what it meant to think he was the Messiah. What it meant was that he was going to go back to Israel, become the king, and bring about the Messianic Revolution. So it meant that if you were living in Turkey back then, you were going to go back to Israel. So many of his followers sold their homes, 
sold their possessions with the expectation that they'd be going back with him to Israel. That's what the expectation was. In 1666, he's thrown into prison, and he's given a choice. Shabtai Tzvi is given a choice. Either you convert to Islam, or we kill you. He put on the turban and converted to Islam. So what happened to all his followers? What happened to all his followers? So you can assume that many of them were very dejected by this, very disappointed, they were shocked, and they had to go back home with a tail between their legs because probably all their friends who didn't believe in shop types were going to make fun of them now. But you have to understand that many, many, many people who believed that shop types was the Messiah did not give up so easily. Even though he had converted to Islam, they had invested so much emotional energy in believing in him, they just couldn't admit. They couldn't admit to themselves, we were wrong. So what many of them believed was that the one in jail was not the real shop type Tzvi. Many of them believed that the person in jail was a double, and that the real shop type Tzvi went up to heaven, and he was going to come back soon to bring them all to Israel. That's what many of them believed. Ultimately, that didn't happen. And what they ended up coming up with was a understanding. They came up basically with a new understanding of the Messiah. The people that wanted to continue believing in him had to come up with a new definition of the Messiah that could accommodate a converted Messiah. And they did. I'm not going to explain how it works now. They came up with a very mystical explanation of why the Messiah was supposed to convert. And they say it was all part of God's plan. And they even found verses in the Jewish Bible to prove that the Messiah was supposed to convert. That's what happened in the 17th century. Second story. In the 1950s, there was a woman who was a channeler. Well, if you know what channelers are, they basically are people who are claiming to be able to contact extraterrestrial beings or people from outer space or different kind of spirits. There are now hundreds and hundreds of channelers in the world. The most famous one, I think, was a woman from Seattle, Washington, or in Washington State somewhere. Her name is Jay-Z Knight. She was channeling a, I think, 35,000-year-old uh, extraterrestrial being called Ramtha. But after her, you know, it became big business. She would charge hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a session with her. So today there are thousands of, of channelers. But in the 50s, there was a woman named Marion Keach, who was a channeler. And she claimed that through automatic writing, she would put her pen down on a piece of paper, and it would write by itself that she was getting messages from alien beings in outer space that were giving her revelations about the world that would be destroyed by a flood on a certain date. And she assembled a whole bunch of followers that believed that she was a real channeler, she, had the real, she was the real deal, and that she really did receive these messages from outer space, and that the world was going to be destroyed by a flood, and they were getting ready for this destruction, they were preparing, they were probably buying tuna fish cans, throwing into their basement, whatever they were doing, and they were trying to convince everybody that this is going to happen, get ready for this big flood. Okay. There was a social psychologist back then, his name was Leon Festinger, with two colleagues, conducted an experiment. He sent in some graduate students to, to infiltrate this group. They were participant observers. And he wanted to see what will happen when this date comes and passes and the world isn't destroyed. He didn't expect the world to be destroyed. But he wanted to see what's going to happen when here these, these people, the whole group is built on this one idea Let's see what happens when the day comes, there's no flood, what's going to happen? He anticipated that the people would not have the reaction to say, oh, she must be a fake, she's a loser, what are we doing following her? He expected that the people in this group would, even after the prophecy was disconfirmed, they would become even more aggressive in trying to bring people into the group. And the kach hava, that's what happened. The day came, there was no flood. But the members of the group didn't give up. They became even more aggressive in trying to convince people that she was a true channeler. And they, they de basically developed, this team of psychologists, a theory called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance basically is when your beliefs butt up against reality, meaning you believe something very strongly, but it's disconfirmed. Reality proves that it's not true. And his theory basically said that when people have invested a lot of emotional energy in believing something, they're not going to give up those beliefs even when it's proven 
in fact that the belief is not true, they will somehow come up with some way of fudging and, and maybe coming up with a way of reinterpreting their beliefs to allow them to persist in the belief. One more story. This is more uh, close to us in uh, time. In the 1970s, there was a Lutheran minister in Massapequa, Long Island, in New York, named Jack Hickman. Jack Hickman was very charismatic, and he attracted a huge following in his church, this Lutheran church. And one day, he announced to the church that he had a revelation. He said that if you want to be a good Christian, if you really want to be a good Christian, he says you have to start living like an ultra-Orthodox Jew. And what happened is his whole church, the men got circumcised, and they all began eating kosher food only, and growing beards, and wearing yarmulkes, and wearing talises, and wearing tefillin, and keeping the Sabbath, and keeping everything very, very, very strictly. And he ended up, they ended up calling him Abba, for father, and they had these big Havdalah ceremonies Saturday night. Uh, they changed the name of their church to Congregation Shoresh Yishai, the root of Jesse. They believed that this particular church would be the one to welcome Jesus back to the world. Anyway, the church grew to an immense church, and because it looked so Jewish, they attracted many, many Jewish people to this group. The group grew and grew and grew until one day they discovered that he was sleeping with little boys in the group. And the people in the group, some of them got very upset by this, and they hired investigators, and they checked out his story. He had been telling them stories about himself, and they discovered that the stories he was telling about himself were not true. So here they have this guy. He's a pig and a liar. And what do you do at that point? I mean, you would imagine everybody's going to bolt. They're all going to run away. So about half of the church left, but half of them stayed. Half of them were not able to leave. They were stuck there. And they began explaining his weird behavior. They said, no, you don't understand. In the Kabbalah, they said it was a Kabbalistic idea that in the Kabbalah, the way the leader is able to find their successor is by having relations with them. And they came up with a whole name for the ceremony, the passing on of the seed or something like that. And they ended up staying with this person. And Leon Festiger would say, this is a perfect example of, again, cognitive dissonance, that they believe this person's a great leader and now that butts up against the, the discovery that he is a horrible person. So what do you do? Either you leave the group or you come up with some incredible rationalization for what's been going on. So in all of these stories, people believe something very strongly. And then what they believe is clearly disconfirmed. Shabtai Tzvi converts to Islam, obviously not the Jewish Messiah. Marian Keech's prophecy totally falls flat on its face. She's obviously not a true channeler. Jack Hickman turns out to be basically a criminal, and yet people are finding it impossible to leave these groups. Sigmund Freud once suggested that when it comes to self-deception, every man is a genius. When it comes to self-deception, every man is a genius. So I would suggest that 2,000 years ago, there are a group of Jews, not many, that think that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah, and they invest a tremendous amount of emotional energy following him. He basically requires that they leave their family, they only follow him, and he was very tough on them. There was one of his students one day says to him, look, great master, my father died. I want to go and bury my father. And Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead. I mean, he demanded absolute obedience, and people sacrificed to be with him. And they traveled with him for three years, expecting him to be the Messiah, and then he's crucified. Now at that point, either you say we were wrong, you admit that we were wrong, he's not the Messiah, or you're going to hang on for dear life. And initially the impulse is to say, okay, he died, but he'll return. And then when he didn't return, to somehow deal with that second, second cognitive dissonance. In the same way the Shabtai Tzvi followers, they thought that Shabtai Tzvi would come back soon, he didn't. So they had, to, they had to come up with a new idea of the Messiah that could accommodate a converted Messiah. So in the same way, we'll learn in two weeks from now, that the followers of Jesus, when he didn't come back, had to invent a new concept of the Messiah that could accommodate a dead Messiah. That became the birth of Christianity. Now, what I will share with you as we wrap up tonight is that Christians will basically respond to what I've just said by claiming that it's not fair, that you can't compare Jesus to Shabtai Tzvi 
or to Marion Keach or to Jack Hickman, because Christians will say, look, you don't see any more followers of these people. You don't see you know, large numbers of Jack Hickmanites in the world today. You don't see large numbers of shop type C followers. Although you should know there is a secretive sect called the Dunmeh who today do follow shop type C. It's quite a large group actually in Turkey, D-O-N-N-E-H. But it's not a very huge group. But the Christians will say that but there are 2.2 billion of us in the world. So how do you compare Christianity to these other groups that came and went? They disappeared, but we're still here. And one of the most popular arguments that Christianity made over the course of history, especially to the Jews, is that the success of the church proves that Christianity is true. If you turn to the last page in your source book, it's a very, very famous passage in the book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the Christian Bible. It's the book that appears right after the four Gospels. It's, again, the last page in your book. And the book of Acts basically picks up the story of Christianity after the death of Jesus. The full name of the book is called The Acts of the Apostles. And here in chapter 5, there is a story where there's a mob that basically wants to either kill or beat the hell out of Jesus' followers. So there's Peter there and some of the other followers of Jesus. This is after Jesus is dead. But there's a group of Jews. It's not clear who they are exactly, but they want to do away with. They want to really hurt or even kill the followers of Jesus. So there's a big to-do, a big uh, uh, controversy here. So into the controversy steps, we're told here, I don't know if this story actually happened, but we'll just read it now anyway. But a Pharisee in the council, so this is in the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee in the council named Gamliel, a teacher of the Torah, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put aside for a short time. Now, he wasn't just a teacher of the law, he was the head of the Sanhedrin. So here the story we're being told is that there's a whole mob that wants to kill the apostles, and in front of the high court, the Sanhedrin, Gamliel gets up and he says, take these people that you want to kill, and we're going to put them outside the courtroom for a few minutes. We're going to talk about them behind their backs. Right? We're going to send them outside. And look what Gamaliel says. He says to them, fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. Not so fast. You want to kill them? He says, not so fast. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody. He wasn't claiming to be Elvis Presley. He was claiming to be the Messiah. Some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be someone, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He had 400 followers, but what happened? He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. But he also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So what Gamaliel says. Gamaliel says, so, in the present case, I tell you, Keep away from these men and leave them alone. He's basically saying, they're doing nothing wrong. Leave them alone. And watch what he says. Because if this plan, meaning if this movement, this Jesus movement, or this undertaking is of human origin, if it's just some human fantasy, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found to be fighting against God. So in this story, what Gamaliel seems to be saying is that there's two possibilities. Either the Jesus movement will disappear by itself, in which case you know that it's false, or he's saying that it's not going to disappear, and it, that then it's a movement of God, then it's true. So for 2,000 years, the Christians have basically been holding this up and saying to us, look, your own rabbi, your own rabbi has proven here that Christianity is true. Because we're still here, not just we're still here, we're the dominant religion in the world, right? The Christianity, if you think about it, Christianity began with 12 Jewish people. That's how the whole thing started, 12 Jewish guys. They ended up converting basically North America and South America and Europe. China and the, many of the Eastern countries becoming increasingly Christian today. Christianity is a huge, huge world religion. And it's been dominant in the world for many, many hundreds of years. So the church has been saying to us, so we must be right, right? Because 
your own teacher, your own rabbi said that if we're right, if Christianity is true, it's not going to go away. It's going to grow and grow and grow. And it won't disappear. And we're still here, they tell us. And this is the argument that the church used during the Middle Ages, during many of the disputations in the Middle Ages when the churches compelled us to debate them or to listen to their sermons in our synagogues. They would say, look, you Jews are degraded, you're persecuted, you're, you're so small, you're a wretched people, and the church is dominant, the church is triumphant. We must be right, you must be wrong. That's the reaction that the church would have to my suggestion tonight, that Christianity is just like all these other groups that experience cognitive dissonance. They would say, please don't compare us to Shabtai Tzvi. He's gone, but we're still here. So let's think about this for a minute. Number one, no Christian in the world, no Christian in the world really believes that a religion that grows and spreads proves that it's true. There's not one Christian in the world that really believes that. Because if that was the case, Islam would be true, Hinduism would be true, and Judaism would be true. We've lasted much longer than Christianity, at least Hinduism and Judaism. So the idea that a religion can be proven to be true if it lasts for a long time is obviously fallacious. And no Christian would accept that premise. As a matter of fact, the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah says, that idolatry will last, idolatry will exist until the end of time, until the Messiah finally comes. The prophet Zechariah says, it's on that day that God's name will be one and he will be one. But until that time happens, God's not going to be one in the world. It's going to be competing religions. So first of all, we have to appreciate that Christians, if you call their bluff, will not really accept this as an argument for the truth of Christianity. Secondly, if we think about it for a minute, this might require a little bit of a thinking cap to be put on, but what did Gamaliel say about these people? He said, they're doing nothing wrong. He said, put them outside, right? We're going to talk about them behind their back. But he says, they're doing nothing wrong, and we should take a wait-and-see attitude. That's what he says. He says, look, there were other cases where people thought they were the Messiah, and look what happened to them. They disappeared. So he basically says, they're doing nothing wrong. Let's take a wait-and-see attitude, and we'll see what happens to them. Now, again, think about this for a second. When today's Christian holds up this story and tries to impress us and says to us, you see, we're still here, what today's Christian does is to read himself or herself back into the story. Today's Christian thinks that Peter, in this story, was a Southern Baptist, pork-eating Trinitarian. That's what today's Christian assumes, that the people standing in front of Gamaliel were just like today's Southern Baptists or today's Pentecostal Christians. If that was the case, if Peter didn't keep the Sabbath, if Peter ate pork, if Peter worshipped Jesus as part of the Trinity, Gamaliel would never have said, leave them alone and do nothing wrong. He would have said they deserve to be executed for, for idolatry. I mean, what you see from this story, and actually from reading the rest of the Christian Bible, is that the followers of Jesus did not abandon Judaism. The followers of Jesus were Torah observant. And they didn't violate the Sabbath. And they didn't stop keeping kosher. And they didn't believe Jesus was God and worship him as God. They were simply Jews who thought he was the Messiah. Had they worshipped him as God, Gamliel would never have been so conciliatory. He would never have said, they're doing nothing wrong, leave them alone. They believe Jesus is God and they're worshiping him. That's idolatry. It's capital crime. So what you see from this story is that the initial followers of Jesus, the Jewish followers of Jesus, were basically Torah-observant Jews. They had one weird thing about them. They thought Jesus was the Messiah. He died. They thought he's going to come back. But that's not impossible in Judaism. Judaism believes in the resurrection of the dead. So they had a weird idea. It was weird, but it wasn't heretical. But what happened to that group? Think about it. What happened to those Torah-observant Jews who just thought Jesus was the Messiah? What happened was that within about 150 years, they disappeared. Because in the year 70, Jerusalem is destroyed. Many of Jesus' Jewish followers are killed when Jerusalem is destroyed. And the rest of them are scattered. And they basically disappear from the face of history. After approximately the year 200 or so, 
you don't find any Torah observant Jews who simply thought that Jesus was the Messiah. The movement became 100% Gentiles who worshipped Jesus as God and did not keep the Torah anymore. It became basically a product of Paul's outreach to non-Jews and it was a completely different movement than the Jesus movement back in Israel. So when Gamliel says, if this movement is of God, you can't stop it, but if not of God, it will fall apart, that's exactly what happened, it fell apart. The Jesus movement, that was a movement of Jews who were Torah observant, that simply thought Jesus was the Messiah, totally disappears from the face of history. So even according to the story in the book of Acts, it would prove that Christianity is not true. Because as Gamaliel says, if it's not true, it'll fall apart. That's exactly what happened. Let's just make a few more final comments and we'll end for tonight. How did Christianity spread? How did it spread to become such a huge religion? So let's think, I'll share with you three possible things to think about. Number one, when Paul went to spread his teachings, in the not, again, in the Gentile world, the Greco-Roman world, you should know that back then, there were about a million people who were called Yirei Elohim, fearers of God. All the historical sources speak about the fact that there were many, many, many non-Jews who admired Judaism. They admired Jews. They respected Judaism. They respected Jews. They admired the fact that Judaism was a religion that was spiritual, that, that had teachings of ethics, that had a long history. And in the pagan world, there were many, many, there were, I think there were at least a million of these non-Jews who were Jewish wannabes. They admired Jews. They would come to the synagogue. They would hang out in the back of the synagogue. And they really wanted to be Jewish. There was one major problem. To convert was very difficult. It meant circumcision if you were a guy. Not very pleasant back then. Not even now, but back then for sure not. And it meant accepting all the commandments of the Torah. A total change of lifestyle. So they weren't going to get many converts. But all of a sudden, Paul comes along and Paul says to these non-Jewish people, you want to be Jewish? All you need to do is believe in Jesus and nothing else is required, basically. You don't have to get circumcised. You don't have to keep kosher. You don't have to keep the Sabbath. So basically, the sale is put on for Judaism. It goes down from $613 to zero. And he's able to attract many, many people to his movement. He does quite well. That's one thing to think about. Second thing to think about is that the movement never really became huge until the 4th century. Until around the year 300 or so, when Constantine, who was the, basically the emperor of the world, Constantine becomes essentially a Christian. It's not clear if he really became a sincere Christian or just a public Christian for public consumption. Historians debate this. His mother was certainly a Christian. He seems to have... Uh, organized his troops to fight a very central battle under the sign of the cross. He took the victory of his people as a sign, and he decided to use Christianity as a way of unifying his empire. So for Constantine, Christianity was a very convenient way to make sure that his huge empire would not pull itself apart by having people who believe so many different things. He wanted to make one standard for the whole empire. For him, Christianity became the state religion. So one of the reasons why Christianity starts to spread is because Constantine sends it off on a very, very big head start. He basically does not offer people to choose Christianity. Now you're a Christian because that's the official state religion. You should realize also that as the church began to spread these teachings, it didn't do it through persuasion primarily. It did it through the force of the sword. So when the church spread Christianity, it wasn't basically to convince people that it was true. They used the might of the sword and the power of the church to force people to convert. Finally, one final reason that I'll suggest that Christianity may have spread. It's not my suggestion. It's offered by Maimonides in the 13th century. Maimonides says the following. We know that when the Messiah finally comes, the whole world is going to understand that he's the Messiah. The problem is, listen carefully, if the Messiah came to a totally pagan world, it would not register with them at all. The, a pagan world wouldn't care much about the Jewish Messiah. Maimonides suggests in his Laws of Kings, which was, by the way, censored. The Christian church pulled it out, but we've since found the, uh, the, the entire document. Maimonides suggests that both Islam and Christianity 
even though he says they're false religions, he says they may have been used by God to prepare the world for the ultimate truth. He says that what happened with the spreading of Christianity and Islam are the spreading of Jewish ideas to the corners of the earth. That with Islam and Christianity, the world knows now about the Bible, they know about the Torah, they know about the concept of the Messiah, they have many things that Christianity and Judaism and Islam have in common, and they've become competitive religions. It's not as if we're like Jews and pagans who have no, there's no engagement. Judaism and paganism have nothing to engage on. But Judaism and Islam and Christianity, we engage, we're competitive. Maimonides says that this competitive nature, this engagement, through these daughter religions of Christianity and Islam, have spread Jewish ideas to the entire world, where now the whole world basically knows about Jews and Judaism, and about Jewish ideas. And he says, when the Messiah finally comes, the world's going to be able to say, oh, now we understand. A pagan world would never say, now we understand. They're, they're out of it. They're, they're out of the loop. But the world of Christianity and the world of Islam, they're in the loop. They just, they have the radio turned on, they have the radio turned on, they're just to the wrong station. When the Messiah finally comes, they'll be able to say, oh, we're just going to adjust now to the proper station. So Maimonides suggests that it's possible that in God's inscrutable ways, Islam and Christianity have come to serve a very important purpose. One last question, or one last issue, and we'll close for tonight. If Gamliel, this is the hardest thing to, to understand, so let's just focus for a minute. If Gamliel did not mean to say that if a religion lasts for a long time, that proves that it's true. He obviously could never have meant that. And there's no one in the world that would believe that's true about other religions. No Christian in the world would accept that premise, that if a religion lasts for a long time, it proves that it's true. So if he didn't mean that, what might he have meant if he said these words? Again, I mentioned I have no reason to believe this story happened. But if it did happen, what might he have meant by saying that if it's true, you can't stop it, and if it's not true, it'll fall apart? What might he have meant? How might those words have some meaning? So I would suggest that what he meant could not have been meant, we say in Hebrew, klape chutz, meaning vis-a-vis outside religions. He could not have been speaking about Judaism vis-a-vis -vis other religions. But what he said could make sense klape pnim, meaning in-house. Within Judaism, within Judaism, how do you know if a movement within Judaism has credibility? How do you know that a movement within Judaism has some credibility? So he might be saying that within Judaism, you can tell. If a movement within Judaism lasts for a very, very long time, you have the sense that God is ensuring this movement is going to last. But if a movement within Judaism falls apart and disappears, that's pretty good proof that the movement never really had any feet. So for example, the Baitusim and the Sadducees and the Karaites, we've had many, many scenes, many movements within Judaism that just simply didn't last. The Chavetz Chaim used to always say, you go to a wedding sometimes, they have these fake flowers. They look very, very real. He said, how do you know if they're fake flowers or they're real flowers? So Chavetz Chaim said, the, flake fla the fake flowers won't have children. Right? They're not going to grow other flowers. The silk flowers are just going to be there. They're not going to have other flowers coming out of them. So what Gamliel may have meant is that within Judaism, right, if a movement persists, and it lasts for a long time, it may be an indication that God has given his imprimatur to this movement, it has legitimacy and credibility within Judaism, and the opposite would be that a movement that has no legitimacy within Judaism, it's not going to last, it's going to disappear. That might be a possible way of reading Gamliel.